uh, Frank Gibson's office. Yeah, exactly as it was when he was in here. Um, last week in March, training all the time until the 15th, uh, 16th stroke, 17th of May, when the raid took place. So he would have sat here not very often, you know, but when he could, since signing up his documents that he had to sign up. Everyone's got books and so on that they'd completed so many hours buying. That was the main thing that he had to do. And take any charges, you know what charges, where someone's disciplined, you know what squadron, an airman, unfortunate, unfortunate airman or something. Just go on a walk for a couple of days, and perhaps mm. without leave or something. So anyway, he sat up here and there's a couple of photos. We know what the office looked like when he had it, so we put it back exactly as it was with the same year period furniture in it and so on. Uh, so he came here in March 1943. They did intensive low level flying training until the 16th stroke 17th of May when they took off to go on the raid. On the six, night of the 16th he came back on the morning of the 17th. And all of them apart from Guy Gibson didn't know what uh, the target was going to be. Mm. But they all got told at uh, the briefings that took place on the day, the 16th of uh, May. So to do all this low level training without knowing what the target was, was quite difficult really. And uh, Gibson had to know uh, because he was in cahoots with Barnes Wallace and he was watching the development, development of the uh, bouncing bomb and all its trials, which didn't actually go all that well. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, because he hadn't designed the bomb properly when they mm -hmm. when they were given permission to carry out the raid, because he'd spent months and months and months trying to convince the RAF that it was a good thing to carry out this raid. But certain people, i.e. Bomber Harris, weren't uh, accessible to the idea because they thought it was nonsense and rubbish. Uh, well, Harris, being Harris, thought it was a waste of time. So, And he, he didn't like these uh, poppycock ideas, so he called them being dreamt up by these uh, wayward scientists uh, to steal 20-odd aircraft off him for about six months, mm -hmm. uh, and so lessen his uh, bombing of Germany. And so, but eventually he was convinced mainly by the chap in charge of the Royal Air Force. Uh, Harris was in charge of Bomber Command. Air Chief Marshal Paul Talk was in charge of the RAF. Somehow or other, someone had sneaked him the film of the bouncing bomb on his trials, and he was all for it. So he had a talk with uh, Harris and convinced him that it would probably be you know, good for him to let some of his aircraft go to this squadron so they could carry out this raid, which he did. And once he was doing that, he was all for it. Once he was told to, you know, to, to do it, he couldn't do enough for them. And it was him that selected Guy Gibson mm -hmm. to be in charge, because he knew Guy Gibson from Guy Gibson, when Guy Gibson was a pilot officer, flying, flying officer on 83 Squadron here at Scampton in 1939-1940, where he did his first tour on Handy Page Hamptons and won his first gallantry medal at DFC, he showed that his, uh, he had outstanding abilities even back then as a leader and a fearless flyer who, who wasn't, didn't worry at all whether he was going to lose his life or not. And that's what made him good, I suppose. And he was also good at leading men, especially once the aircraft had taken off. Not quite so good at leading them when they were on the ground uh, because he wasn't liked by quite a lot of his air crew. In fact, the air crew were split into officers and senior NCOs, and he didn't like talking to his senior NCOs because of the way he was brought up. He was brought up to think that uh, they were beneath him, mm -hmm. the other ranks, he called them the sergeants and the flight sergeants. And that was the not quite, quite uh, not so nice side of Gibson, his arrogant side. But apart from that, he was the right person for the job at the time. And carried out the raid. It was a successful raid. 
and uh, he got a Victoria Cross for it, so he must have done something right. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was also chosen, not least because he was the most experienced pilot in Bomber Command at that time, in 1943, having done at least 150 missions. Uh, and that's quite a lot. If you think 13 missions to a tour, and when you've done a tour, it takes two or three months, you usually have a, a rest posting to an operational training unit or a training unit to train other air crews uh, and so that you're safe for some time. Then you're posted back to operational tours again. So he'd already done one complete one here at Skelton. He tried to do one immediately afterwards, but they wouldn't. Uh, but they posted him to a training unit. He got off that by contacting Bomber Harris, and Bomber Harris sent him to Fighter Command, where he became a night fighter pilot for 99 missions. He then got promoted at the behest of um, Harris to Wing Commander, because he'd been promised this by Harris when he was sent to be a night fighter pilot. He then got promoted to Wing Commander and was given his own squadron, 106 Squadron, First of all at Conisby and then at Syaston. And he completed another complete tour on that. And it was when he was coming to the end of that tour that he was uh, sent for by uh, the group commander, Ralph Cochrane, uh, after being given the OK by Harris uh, and asked if he would do one more special raid and he would be in charge of forming the squadron and carrying out the raid. And that, of course, was the downbusters rate, Operation Chastise. It was 24 at the time, so most experienced pilot, six years older than you, uh, 24. And he was killed 15 months later when he was 26, still as a wing commander. But between the time after the raid, he was grounded, so he didn't get a lot of flying in for those 15 months. He just managed to scrounge a few flights. Um, one or two of them were operational flights, but he shouldn't have been on any of them really because he was still grounded. But <clears throat> not being a good one for doing as he was told sometimes, he managed to get on a few uh, flights himself. And the last one he was killed on, was so that was an operational bombing raid over Garlemkirchen in Germany, just over the Dutch border, uh, as a master bomber in a Mosquito. Mm -hmm. yeah. Six. Two seven squadron at the Lord's Path. And, well, it was an accident waiting to happen, I suppose. He, he was being grounded. Uh, he'd taken, he got himself on this raid. He didn't have a navigator. I suppose the people that were supposed to go as the master bomber weren't available yeah. for yeah. some reason or other. May have been ill. Someone was ill. So he put himself in, in their place. Yeah. Didn't have a navigator. So he went to the mess at Coningsby and asked for a volunteer navigator for him the next night, this mm. was the day before. Uh, no one volunteered, not least because uh, they, they thought he was a bit of a madman, you know, didn't want to fly with him. <laughs> um, but so he detailed some unfortunate squadron leader that was sat in the mess, which was squadron leader Warwick. Mm. And on the raid, where he was master bomber, so that he was in charge of about four mosquitoes that laid the markers and were responsible for the maybe two or three or four hundred bombers that were following to bomb these markers. They'd fly up and he would have been in charge of them would fly in circles above the bombers carrying out the raid, making sure they were accurate. And after they'd all turned around and gone back and completed the raid successfully, it would be his turn to go back, uh, which he did do at low level. And he also went back on a different route to which he was briefed to go back on. Uh, and he was at low level up over a town called Steenbergen when he mysteriously crashed and the aircraft burst into a ball of flames and obliterated the two crew. So they, they didn't realise, uh, all they found, all the Dutch people found to begin with was one dog tag with squadron leader Warwick's name on it and two hands and two, this is a bit gory, two hands and two feet and so they thought Oh, there was only one, there was only the pilot on this yeah. aircraft. It wasn't until a few days afterwards, or a couple of days later, this was the Dutch people, not the Germans, found another hand, and they also found a sock with Guy Gibson's laundry mark in it. 
they then mm -hmm. knew that uh, the Dutch people knew that it was poor old Pagans that had been killed as well. So the Dutch people buried him in the Roman Catholic churchyard, churchyard in Steenbogen, and the grave's still there today, and they've looked after it. One family, I think, have looked after it, and their generations ever since have looked after it very well. So well that the relatives, Mrs. Gibson, who was asked if she wanted her husband's body and Scottish and Warwick relatives were asked if they wanted their bodies repatriated or put into a large military mm -hmm. cemetery in Germany or Holland. Uh, but they said no, because it's looked after so well in Steenburg. <coughs> so that's where it is. We're not quite sure to this day why it crashed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I probably better not go into that. I know I'll probably a lot more about it, but you know, there are only suppositions. I will just say that he crashed because he seemed to run out of fuel and there's a lot of ifs and buts. Why did he run out of fuel? Mm. There's plenty of fuel on the aircraft. Maybe that he didn't switch over from one tank to another tank, one dry tank to a full tank in time. Uh, and there's other things saying that he didn't know the mosquito really well because he'd only flown in it mm. twice. And his uh, navigator, Warwick, had only flown in it back once yes. when he was killed. Uh, and so there's a lot of unanswered questions, but uh, we'll just leave it that Gibson was a very brave man, and unfortunately, 15 months after this raid, he was killed, trying to do what he thought he was born to do, that's fly, and um, now win the war against the Nazis, who were killing millions of people in concentration camps and so on. And that's what he was trying to do. And got the VC for this raid. And he sat here. So if you want your picture taken here, you're welcome to sit in your depths, put his pipe in your hand. <laughs> Go in your mouth. <laughs> what next door? No, that's a fake door. Okay. Well, that's where the door was. So okay. put the door back. The next door would have been his officer who looked after the squadron, called his adjutant. All life is personal assistance. Oh, you got that back on, yeah? Yeah, I've just left it for a few minutes. So, the this board was on in there, on that. That's right, right. it was, yeah. Any questions so far? That was bad, I think. He's one of the pilots called Harold Martin. And if you look at the board, there's all the crews left. Harold Martin's this one. So that's him. Uh, there's all your 19 crews that took part in the raid. Number one, number 19. Seven crew members along each line. And the red. Um, Poppies indicate they were killed that night, the 16th or the morning of the 17th. And if you count them, there's 53. Eight aircraft didn't come back. Actually, uh, went all the way, and he was the last one to get to the, the third dam. And by the time he got there, it was misted in, popped up, so he brought his bomb back. Mm -hmm. uh, and he landed last uh, and uh, with the bomb in the mm -hmm. And because of that, Gibson told him off and yeah, yeah. posted him off the squadron. Mm -hmm. When he asked him what the problem was, he said the truth. He said, yeah, the problem now is that he's going to And he disagreed with him. He said, I don't think he went to the I think the problem is that he's going to have to wait to get that. But personally,
Yeah, they've just gone down the other room, but I can make you a cup of tea if you want. Oh, thank you. A cold drink. Thank if you. If you follow me. <laughs> do you want to follow me? Yep. Yeah. So that's it, the identical seat that's in the Hawk. Uh, and that went wrong and killed one of the pilots yeah. a couple of years back. I remember that. In 14. Uh, I can't catch you up, but if you keep disappearing. Are you going to have a tea with Yeah, time for that. Are you going to have a little This Yeah, this is just a memorial room. It's been made into a little chapel where we've got um, a photograph of the two Red Arrows pilots that were killed. Oh. And what some of the veterans were getting in the 90s always go and sit down in there. As a, a tribute to their service. Yeah. 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 That's the one you were talking about earlier. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It would have been used for to sink uh, battleships and things, but it was never yeah, used. Yeah. It's called Highball. Uh, Again designed by Gibson. Mm. Uh, sorry, Barnes Warren. Yeah. <laughs> mm. oh, yeah. oh, well, this is the high tech room. You'll all remember from those that have seen the film. Downbusters, the, the bomb aimer, yeah. use one of these, or another one with two movable arms. But as he was laid on his belly, four big engines shaking away, a big bomb, uh, sorry, a big mine, revolving at 500 revs a minute, shaking as well. He's laid here, I'm trying to do that, so line these two pins up with the towers on the dam. This has got his the bomb release in his other hand, so not very stable. Mm -hmm. It was only a couple or so used them. Yeah, the 19 crews probably only two used yeah. them. Yeah. Gibson so some yeah. mechanical genius came up 
with this and a Chinagraph pencil. Two lines under the canopy. I'm not sure where this was held, either on the Just nose, on, on the, the chin, end, on the end of your nose. The end of yeah. the nose. And you here, you've got the bomb release. And when these two lines come up, coincide with the towers, bombs away. Or if you miss that one and have to fly onto the second bridge, or the second dam, you go to the second knot. And you have that there, because the towers were a different distance away, distance apart. So of course you need to make adjustments for it. And that's how that was done as well. And it obviously worked, because two dams destroyed. But, uh, and these are uh, different aircraft that have been stationed here at one time or another. That's the plane that uh, Gibson got killed in. Which one? Oh, this one. And on the Mosquito there, these are two parts from the plane that Guy Gibson was in when he crashed. Piece here and another piece down here. Mm. Then there was the lights on the, the nose and the tail. Uh, well, I thought you'd done all that before. No, I missed well, some of it. Right? Well, I've mentioned it. But, yeah. You know. Oh, of course. Yeah. The uh, the uh, the lights on the front and after the aircraft shining down. The angle was made so that. When they joined to make a figure of eight, they knew they were at 60 foot. So once they were then at 60 foot, the pilot had to maintain that height. Obviously, not an easy job when you've got people shooting <laughs> missiles at you. They expose it. You know, not very nice. So he's concentrating there to keep it straight and level, and then it's down to the bomb aimer. We have to do his bit on his piece of string. Mm. Obviously, I don't think it would have been a piece of string like this because it's a bit too stretchy. So, yeah. And then again, you'd have to make adjustments for somebody like me with a larger nose. <laughs> a normal size nose <laughs> and a shorter piece of string. Mm. So, uh, another thing about this is that <coughs> if, if you look at this, piece of string, this this piece of cord here that didn't have anything to do with it, it's good to, it's good to have that because that showed you the position of the wings, mm. whether they were, you know, one wing down or the other wings down or you were level, mm. so you could tell straight away, and it's not easy to tell if it's only the wings are slightly down, no. you know. So to summarise, you know, the crews, when they attacked the dam and got onto the water, If you take that picture there, that painting, the uh, the pilot would have just had the control column and kept the wings level. The flight engineer sat next to him would have uh, controlled the throttles for a speed of 220 miles an hour. Um, the navigator would have got up out of his seat and stuck his head on the right hand side blister in the cockpit. There's a blister in the cockpit where you can put your head in it and see how quite clearly, and because those lights were tilted to the right, he would have been looking at those lights and waiting for them to come together, and he would have been shouting to the pilot whether he needs to go up or down or steady. The wireless operator's job was to get down in the fuselage where that motor is and start the motor, the hydraulic motor, that spun the bomb at 500 revs backwards, backspin. So he would have had to get down in the fuselage next to where that motor is and throw the switches or throw the valves, alter the valves to start that motor and had a rev counter so he could see when it's at 500 revs. He would have been shouting to the pilot as well, you know, mm -hmm. it's either at 450 or 
495 hundred. Okay, dead on. Um, and that left the pilot just to, and of course the bomb aimer, who, which you've described, was doing that job. So everyone had a little job to do, and they all needed to be able to speak to each other. And that's why Monroe turned back when he had no radio. Mm -hmm. So they needed, you know, you all need to work together. Because on the first dam, they had to put up with flak. On the second dam, there was no guns firing at them. But because the terrain was more mountainous, the water was more difficult to get down to and get a good bombing run on. And so the three pilots that attacked that, each of them tried four, five, six, seven, up to ten times, round and round to get the position de dead right. And on um, McCarthy's aircraft, sorry, not McCarthy's aircraft, uh, this was on the second dam, yeah, on, the, on the, one of the attacks, he still didn't get, Maudsley couldn't get it quite right and he released his bomb late and it skipped over the top and hit the top of the dam mm. and uh, exploded unfortunately as he was flying across it and damaged his aircraft. They thought he'd crashed right there and then but it seems that he got about another 100 miles before he was shot down. Mm. He was damaged and all, all his crew were killed. Uh, the third dam was attacked in a different way, just by dropping the bomb, not using the bouncing. But again, that one was difficult to get at because you're actually flying across and parallel with the dam and there's mountains both sides. So you have to get right down onto the dam wall very quickly and get your position right and uh, then drop your bomb. But I think that, that one, McCarthy's aircraft, went round 11 times mm -hmm. before... Johnny Johnson got it right yeah. and uh, <coughs> managed to be in the right position to release the bomb and it was a good hit. Mm. But the rear gunner was getting quite upset and nervous about things, you know, because all this flying round and round made them good targets for any night fighters that mm. were prowling around. So having talked to Johnny Johnson a few weeks ago, he did say that he got sworn at by the rear gunner who said uh, something to the effect of, when the bloody hell are we going to drop this bloody bomb, you know, mm -hmm. and get out of here. And when he did drop it, he congratulated him and said, thank God for that, let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit of uh, joking still going on mm. in, in the group. And that's it really in here. That's very good. That's all right, I just summarised it. Are they coming for two? I don't know, if you've got a pass, you can go in the mess if you want to stay here. That's terrain follow radar that was fitted to the Vulcan there, which is that um, radar that sticks out the front of the uh, Vulcan in the picture there, went in its hangar. And that was used to fly anywhere as low as 200 feet up to 1,000 feet in 200 feet steps. And they only started doing that halfway through their lives. They were a high level bomber to start off with. But then in the mid-60s it was realised after Gary Powers was shot down that hardly any of the RV bombers would get through if, mm -hmm. uh, if they attacked Russia. So they went down at low level and they had to buy one of the first terrain following radars off the Americans to fit to the Vulcan. And it worked quite well. It was manual. 
it didn't feed into the autopilot and actually fly the aircraft. It, uh, it was a bar on, on an instrument, the bar moved up and down and you had to follow the bar and keep it in the middle. Hmm. Well, the pilot did. A bit hair raising, I think, in the <laughs> 200 feet at 400 knots. Right.